Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everybody, let us uh, continue with our lecture series on this optimal control guidance and estimation course. So, last two lectures we have seen some of this uh, uh, advanced concept or recently developed concept rather we call as model predictive static programming and followed by its uh, uses in, uh, in various uh, aerospace guidance applications. So, we will continue that uh, line of thought in this lecture as well and uh, probably give some of these extensions ideas on on top of this uh, basic idea basically. So, here we will talk about something called model predictive spread control very close to static programming, but we will also see a slightly different version parameterized version and all that. And also we will see this uh, something a uh, very recent development rather as of today something called generalized uh, MPSP. That means, uh, we do not want to deal in discrete domain, but we want to have develop this entire procedure in the con continuous time domain where discrete time thing uh, turns out to be kind of a special case actually. So, all right. So, let us get uh, going. The outline of this particular lecture is a uh, little bit on motivation followed by this uh, MPSC design what we call model predictive static control okay, you can or spread control basically okay, model predictive spread control design. Uh, followed by th this, uh, I mean, this will uh, within this framework, we will talk about mathematical development and uh, the alignment angle constraint mid course guidance of a tactical missile. That will be followed by this generalized MPSP design again, mathematical development followed by another tactical missile guidance application uh, with 3D impact angle constraint, essentially the same application that we discussed in the last lecture basically. But uh, it will be solved in the GMPSP uh, procedure. That's how. Then we'll have some uh, some concluding remarks uh, and wind it up basically. So let's see this. Uh, first thing is model predictive spread control or parameterized MPSP. You can think about that way also basically. Okay. All right. So let's see uh, what is the motivations here. First thing is. Uh, high computational efficiency, we do not want to compromise uh, that particular aspect of MPSP actually. So, we want to retain that. In fact, you are asking one more question that can it be still better than MPSP, ok. So, is it possible still? Second is uh, again the same thing, uh, terminal constraints will be met, met as hard constraint and especially in missile guidance problem this leads to very high accuracy basically, ok. And no approximation of system dynamics. Uh, and then minimum control usage, uh, these are all similar to MPSP what you have seen before. And in addition to that, we are telling can the computational efficiency be slightly better and the last one we are talking is can control smoothness be guaranteed by enforcement. Okay. It should not be kind of a luck, but by enforcement we should be able to guarantee that basically. So, is it possible to do that? Let us see, this is how we propose to do this. See, uh, MPSP design, uh, what happened is uh, we had a system dynamics, something like x dot is f of x u and y is h of x and we discretized it to this this form, x of k plus 1 is f k of x k u k and then y k is h of x k. That is the first thing to do there. Then the objective is uh, y n should go to y n star with some additional or optimal objective sort of things. So, in the process of analysis, what you are told is, okay, uh, this, this delta y n should go to 0, y n minus y n star, but how what is the philosophy of design? Uh, we have to guess a control history and then simulate the system dynamics, you compute the error in the output at the final time okay. and then uh, update the control history optimally utilizing this error information. We iterate the control history until convergence, that is what the basic philosophy of MPSP design was actually. So, in the process of analysis, we told okay, this is our uh, error and we approximate the smaller approximation sort of thing and then this d y n can be expanded that way where d x n can be expanded in the in terms of previous state and previous control, previous control we keep it, but previous state we expand in terms of another previous state and previous control things like that. And ultimately, we will end up with this this kind of a 
uh, expression for d y n and then we do the define this uh, this coefficient as something like uh, sensitivity matrices and these sensitivity matrices can be computed recursively and we also told that okay initial condition uh, is known uh, known precisely so this error in the initial condition should turn out to be zero basically i mean and then what we uh, really get is some some linear expression something like this that was okay after this the, the idea was to minimize the control history everywhere and in, in other words to minimize some sort of a quadratic performance index actually in terms of these errors in control essentially but here we will depart a little bit in this design and tell okay that is that that form is okay but can we really think of something like a parameterized version of the control to begin with let us talk about something like a linear parameterization in other words we tell that the previous control history including the guess control is in the form of linear expression in terms of time to go okay so the, the t go or t f my okay by definition okay something like we know t go is nothing but t f minus t wherever current time is actually so you can parameterize uh, with respect to t also no harm okay but uh, typically in guidance problems we parameterize with respect to t go basically uh, that is compatible with guidance literature basically anyway so this is a linear expression in terms of t go and this is also the updated control has to be a linear approximation in terms of t go as well however what happens is uh, here the parameters are a not and v not that's like a linear straight line equation sort of thing and here it is a and v so the idea here is how do we compute a and v given the fact that we know a0 and v0 basically so we, we uh, now knowing this this uh, uk0 and uk we define this this duk as something like uh, what we did before however this particular expression okay can be exp once we substitute this expression here and here okay you substitute uh, uk not with this guy and uk with this expression then it turns out that duk can be approximated as delta a times t go k plus delta b okay where delta a and delta b are defined as these errors actually now what you see here the, the entire expression of control okay duk is expressed in terms of delta a and delta b no matter what value of k is actually so for various values of k the t go k will change for delta a and delta b will remain same and taking advantage of that when you go back to this expression here we write uh, this this expression again okay will turn out to be something like this okay you substitute all this expression what you get here and it turns out to be something like this okay. so what you define so this entire thing can be defined as something like cy and the entire thing can be defined as dy then it turns out that uh, dyn can be expressed as a, some sort of a linear combination of delta n delta v okay so the whole idea here is the entire flexibility boils down to only in terms of delta n delta v in other words we can simply update this this a and v coefficients and we are done actually so the number of free variables in this particular case reduces to only two okay. that is because we have actually parameterized in terms of linear expression and linear expressions typically i mean straight line expressions to be very exact uh, so the straight line expressions can can have only two flexible parameters actually so because of that uh, this dyn has become a function of only delta a delta b and as we know this uh, this sensitivity matrices are can always be computed recursively that you can see some previous lectures to how do you do that in all that all right the the point is it it is now a linear expression in terms of delta a and delta b uh, now what happens here is uh, we we formulate uh, this uh, this optimization problem now telling that okay the optimize this quadratic cost function okay subject to this expression what you have got just simply got it here actually dyn is cy times delta a plus dy times delta b but you can always substitute what is delta a and what is delta b and solve for solve it in terms of a and b basically so if you just uh, substitute that and then uh, rewrite the same expression turns out to be this expression actually okay. so what you are telling here is we optimize this cost function subject to this linear constraint actually now what is the idea behind uh, optimizing this quadratic cost function in other words uh, i mean we are in, we are interested in a solution with uh, with a and b both being minimum actually 
now if you go to a straight line uh, go to a straight line expression what do they what do they mean basically now if you see this expression it is something like uh, a and b will represent something uh, something like uh, y intercept and slope actually okay all right so if you if you i mean if you go back to this expression this a not and v not and a and v what you see here okay will represent a is nothing but this uh, slope in terms of t go and b is nothing but the y intercept actually okay so if you if you plot this as function of t go this is nothing but a okay is a slope and b is the y intercept sort of thing actually okay so by demanding that uh, the slope should be minimum and y intercept should be minimum what you are telling is okay it should be almost like a constant function not necessarily a constant unless uh, a is exactly zero but subject to the the optimization procedure here okay if a is very small or close to zero rather then the, the the control profile that you are interested is is almost constant and because b is also zero what you are telling is the constant value is almost close to zero basically Okay, so the, the value of the constant should also become close to zero. So that's the whole idea of why we want to uh, kind of minimize this cost function actually. Again, how much you want to play with the slope and how much you want to play with the intercept, it all depends on the values of R one and R two. Okay, if you if you select both to be same, then you are giving equal importance. Otherwise, if you one is relatively higher than the other, then I mean. Uh, the importance of that particular expression becomes higher actually in other words if r1 is higher compared to r2 then the solution will tell that a becomes smaller than v actually okay all these things you have discussed in lqr class also basically anyway so coming back uh, this is the objective to to optimize or minimize this cost function subject to this linear constraint obviously it's a static optimization problem again and uh, it's a very simpler problem actually okay so it uh, the solution of that again you go you have to formulate a j bar and then uh, take derivative of j bar with respect to a i mean for del j bar by del a equal to 0 and del j bar by del b equal to 0 and del j bar by del lambda also equal to 0 okay then you will turn out the solution turns out to be something like this actually okay a and b will turn out to be like this where lambda can be computed that way so again uh, in other words uh, you got a solution okay in terms of a static lambda again and the solution turns out to be only two variables actually okay. no matter how long is the control history and things like that the solution turns out to be just two so it in a way it also addresses the problem of this uh, this curse of dimensionality in uh, in some sense because it now doesn't depend on what is the length of your control application time you know so even if your control application time turns out to be high or the number of grid points are high then actually it is it doesn't matter it it, um, it is immaterial of that actually okay so in that sense it kind of addresses that problem as well anyway so this is what it is now remember this optimization can be done only when the the dimension of this equation turns out to be smaller than the dimension of a and b i mean a b vector together that means uh, the dimension of this uh, this constant equation turns out to be smaller than 2 okay in other words the objective is just one actually okay. so if you talk about uh, kind of a michel gaidens problem if you talk about only mis distance sort of thing then this is this is perfect actually otherwise uh, what happens is the constraint uh, if the if the constraint turns out to be of equal dimension that means number of variables are same as number of uh, constraint then you simply solve it in other words there is no flexibility of optimizing a and b basically and that is obvious okay now coming to this uh, this uh, control parameterization suppose somebody doesn't want this linear parameterization or it turns out to be very restrictive it doesn't give you a solution and things like that so the time to think about something like a little more general so this turns out to be a quadratic function in terms of t or t go either way that choice is up to us actually so there we do it with respect to t go and uh, somebody can always think about okay i can uh, i don't want it i'll i'll parameterize with respect to simply t okay so it turns out to be uk is a function of t okay this at square plus btk plus c sort of thing this is a quadratic expression now and uh, uk is again this control update has to happen this way so duk is by definition this this two values and hence it is again you can do this 
and all the time nicely it turns out that the error in parameters uh, turns out to be linear actually. It, the coefficients if you look at it, they turns out to be some sort of something like a linear expression. Basically. So, again you go back to this x-ray expression and turn ok, this can be done that way okay. and then uh, the, uh, what you substitute all that expression to get something, something similar to what you had done before. Now, the, the parameters uh, or the free parameters rather are in terms of a, b and c. So, the equation again you can write it as some sort of a linear expression in terms of parameter variables something like this c y d y e y b lambda and d y and all that you can define properly and then tell okay this equation turns out to be some sort of a uh, equation of a well equation of a plane actually in 3D now. Okay, so, you have three variables only to solve for again no matter how whatever is the control application length you can we, we restrict it in terms of parameters a b c basically. All right, so now what happens here is uh, uh, we go back to this and then tell okay what is the cost function to optimize again. And assume that this uh, the dimension of this is equal to dimension of the number of equation then there is no optimization you can directly solve it something like this it turns out to be this this will turn out to be a square matrix in that case ok. The same equation what you get here is written in terms of vector matrix thing here and it turns out to be a square matrix provided the number of equations are 3 a b c okay. and then in that case you can solve it ok in terms of this uh, directly in terms of in matrix inversion and all that. And remember this has to be a 3 by 3 matrix. So, the matrix inversion is not computational intensive either actually. The dimension of that will depend on uh, again the number of free variables uh, you are talking in terms of parameters actually. Okay. Now, if it is not equal in other words the number of unknowns is greater than the number of uh, uh, number of uh, equations then there is a there is a scope for optimization and again motivated by our previous discussion we can think of optimizing this cost function subject to this this constant equation actually. So, again the idea of this cost function is uh, if you take a quadratic uh, I mean quadratic uh, variable okay. it turns out to be something something like a quadratic variable like this then uh, I mean the C again represents uh, y intercept this remember this is T this is uh, whatever control and it is a quadratic parameterization. So, C represents the y intercept B represents the slope A represents the curvature things like that. So, again by optimizing this what you are telling is curvature has to be minimum, slope has to be minimum and y intercept has to be minimum. Because again we are interested in some sort of a, a constant control history throughout ok which will give us uh, the result uh, I mean what we are desired for uh, even though it is uh, mathematically speaking it is going to be quadratic actually. But what you are interested is somewhat close to I mean somewhat close to constant actually that is what you are telling by optimizing this actually. That way. Okay. All right. So this is the idea behind uh, this uh, parameterized version of uh, MPSP. Okay. Or you can, I mean, we name that as MPSC, and somebody can al always tell it as parameterized MPSC, MPSP actually. Anyway, so this is what it is. So algorithm sense, it is the same, uh, very very similar to what we have done before. The only difference is we have to guess a control history in terms of control parameterization. You know, in other words, the initial guess itself has to be in the form of same parameterization. Uh, suppose we start with uh, straight line parameterization, then the guess also needs to be straight line. Quadratic parameterization means guess is also quadratic like that. Then propagate the system dynamics, compute the output, check convergence. If it is converged already, take it uh, and stop it actually. Otherwise, you compute the sensitivity matrices, same thing as uh, what you have done in MPSP, but then update the control history using parameter updates actually. Okay. Using the sensitivity matrices, you compute the updated parameters and then proceed for the for the actually. This is the only difference here. Okay. Now MPSC design, if you think about why it is computational efficiency and all, it turns out to be very similar. The ideas are very similar to MPSP, so hence the reasons are also very similar actually. And in other, in on top of that, we also get a, a little better computational efficiency because. Uh, uh, in terms of free number of free variables, we are reducing the uh, dimension quite a lot actually. In MPSP, we had all sort of grid number of grid points multiplied by dimension of the control vector, that many free variables were there. 
Now here it turns out to be okay number of control into number of free parameterization for each each dimension or each element of the control vector. So if you have let's say two control and you have got about uh, quadratic parameterization that means uh, u1 is a quadratic function and u2 is also a quadratic function then the total number of free variables is 2 into 3 so that is 6 actually so it uh, it come it kind of makes it completely independent of number of grid points and hence uh, it is independent of uh, uh, i mean this it in a limited sense it addresses the the issue of uh, i mean uh, this curse of dimensionality however we also remember that uh, we also need to compute the sensitivity matrices and that is a function of uh, number of grid points Okay, so we really don't uh, get rid of the curse of dimensionality in, in that sense, but to so to some extent it addresses that issue basically. Okay, all right. Uh, uh, now moving on, we'll see some application of this, uh, and this problem turns out to be angle constraint mid course guidance using this technique actually. So the objective here is the interceptor must have sufficient capability uh, and proper initial condition for terminal guidance phase. And mid course guidance, uh, so, okay. Now, the whole idea here is uh, I mean, uh, I think I have talked about that before as well, okay. So, let me talk a little bit here. So, if you if you got a target which is coming or running away, whatever it is, you are finally you, okay, you launch a missile, it, it, it goes there, and finally the idea is, is to go and uh, somewhere it has to engage actually. So, this is the target. Now, this, this uh, final uh, this entire phase of guidance. Uh, can be divided into three segments. Okay, one is uh, this is launch phase, okay, or boost phase, something is called, and this is terminal phase. The last phase of the engagement, and the large part turns out to be just a mid-course guidance actually. Okay, so that is where uh, a large part of the trajectory of the missile uh, lies, and this is the problem that you are talking about here actually. Okay. All right, so that's the okay. So interceptor spends most of its time during mid course phase, and hence uh, should be energy efficient. That's more important actually. However, what you are telling here is, uh, see, finally it has to go and uh, engage with the target. So ultimately, the terminal phase uh, dictates uh, what is your missed distance, angle constraint, and things like that. So to have a proper initial condition for the terminal phase, we also need some sort of a angle constraint at the end of the mid course guidance phase actually. And that is what the problem is actually. The interceptor has to reach the desired point, okay, that uh, x d y d z d will be given to it, okay, with desired heading angle phi d and desired flight path angle also gamma d basically. And that should happen using this minimum acceleration or minimum normal acceleration actually, which is n phi n n y sort of thing. So, this is the problem that we are talking here, okay, this is uh, I mean if you visualize this problem that way. This is the three dimensional plane where this uh, dynamics is given like this x dot y dot z dot something like uh, v cosine gamma which is this component times uh, cos phi this is your x dot x dot component similarly v cos gamma sin phi is your y dot component and v sin gamma is your z dot component. And then you have phi dot and gamma dot also how they change it phi dot and gamma dot they can be derived something like this actually. Okay, now the whole idea here is uh, how do I come up with this norm, this accelerations n phi and n gamma, so that I will I will achieve the objective basically. And here the little bit idea was okay. See the, remember our MPSP or MPSP word MPSC, the demand uh, final time actually. Okay, so the final time typically is uh, is not known because again it depends on the trajectory to be followed, and it depends on the the acceleration that we apply n phi and n gamma. The point is we do not know it a priori actually. Okay. So, how do you get it there? But the whole idea here is suppose we want to go to a point uh, something like x naught y naught z naught that is what uh, the point is right x d y d z d that is what we want to go there. So, that particular point if you think about in this plane okay, the typical the guidance phase happens in terms of something called uh, down range and cross range. That means if the target is somewhere in this direction, okay, the, and the velocity turns out to be like that, it will go somewhere to that direction. So this one is something like a downrange plane, okay, and then anything happens perpendicular to that happens to be cross-range plane actually. So what you are assuming here is x is the kind of a downrange plane, okay. That's how that axis system is defined. Okay. 
x is the down range plane and y and z whatever happens in that happens to be the cross range plane sort of thing. So, what you are assuming here is uh, the down range is monotonic okay, and hence you can rewrite this equation in terms of these variables actually. So, this is uh, dt by dx, this is dy by dx, this is dz by dx sort of thing. So, it, in other words taking x as a free variable we rewrite this equation because ultimately we know the value of this x d. Okay. Now, when x goes to x d and x being a monotonic variable it will go to x d because x d is uh, greater than x naught obviously. Okay. So, when x goes to x d the problem formulation demands that y should go to y d, z should go to z d, phi should go to phi d and gamma should go to gamma d actually. This is, okay. When x goes to x d all other things y should go to y d, z should go to z d and phi and gamma should go to their corresponding values. Note that we are not putting any restriction on v because we are our aim is not to control v. In other words, the final impact velocity can be anything, we are not so much bothered about it and this is not really an impact velocity because we are talking about end of mid course guidance, so it is not uh, end of terminal phase. The idea here is typically if you see mid course guidance literature, how do you how do you maximize this V f that is also important. Because ultimately you want to have the either range enhancement or you talk about impact velocity being high. But here we are not talking about that, what you are interested in is uh, we want to guide the vehicle to a particular desired point and at that desired point the phi and gamma should also have some desired values basically. Okay. So, that is the that is the problem. All right. So, this is the system dynamics. Now, these are the control variables. So, we followed this uh, let us say we do that in in terms of quadratic parameterization. Uh, remember the free variable is not t, but x actually here the down range. So, in terms of down range we parameterize n phi and n gamma and then the error function turns out to be like this y z phi n gamma and then you apply your MPS, MPSC results whatever we have, we have seen before actually this kind of logic. And initial value of uh, okay, uh, initial value of this uh, parameter values a 1 v 1 c 1 a 2 v 2 c 2 they were found using this uh, augmented p n guidance which does not talk about angle constraint, but it will take you there basically. Okay. The position constraint will be met, angle constraint will not be met. So, you generate a control history like that and uh, using least square feet you can uh, do this initialization of a 1 v 1 c 1 and a 2 v 2 c t. So, from there you start and then uh, update this this coefficient values using this algorithm. So, then this uh, result sense you can see this uh, this kind of thing you have this uh, position and this x y z. So, this is your initial condition okay this is this is our initial condition and finally, you have to go there okay. For case 1 you have to go there and case 2 also the position remains same, but angle is different actually. For case 1 we want this angle, case 2 we want that angle actually. And you can see very quickly how it, it uh, is able to go there. We see the error values, it was something using this uh, this uh, p n guidance the error was something uh, very high sort of thing. Even then the correction of the error is very quick only only 4 iterations you can see the reduction of the miss actually, reduction of the separation distance basically. Okay. So, uh, in 3 kilometer or, or almost like 4 kilometer separation it reduces to something like uh, well 1 meter and, and 2 meters sort of thing actually, I may mean, say so 1 meter, 3 meter like that. So, that is the position part of it. What about the angle? And angle also you see 42 starting from uh, 42 degrees, 20 degrees and all it is very very quickly it is able to give you I mean give us very small errors in the desired value. This phi f minus phi d turns out to be the errors actually what you get. Okay, So, no matter whether it is case 1 or case 2 it is able to uh, sorry no matter the case 1 or case 2 what we are seeing here is, is for case 1 anyway it is able to reduce very quickly actually. Okay, just 4 iterations that is how. Okay, so, this is uh, also you can see this how this iterations proceed uh, from trajectory to trajectory. Initially it was something like this and first iteration, second iteration, third and fourth are almost off of each other actually. So, that is the final desired value. Similarly, on z first iteration uh, this is your guess in the first uh, I mean this iteration 1, 2 and 3, 4 basically. So, like that actually you see all the variables they they uh, how they converge and converge quickly also. Now, the angle angle uh, value it was going somewhere that way first iteration, second iteration, third and fourth it is it is there and what you want actually like that. 
So, this is uh, for case 2 and if you see how to, how it improves with iteration again you can see that from starting from 3.4 kilometer and again almost like 4 kilometer uh, separation distance reduces to something like half a meter and some 6, 7 meters which is so it is not uh, terminal phase so we are not talking about missed distance but whatever is the desired distance with very close to that we are I mean whatever the desired point we are going very close to that. And then at that point uh, the angle constraints are also getting met very good starting from 12.5 degrees and almost like 39 degrees we are able to reduce it to very small values actually. In fact, if somebody wants you can continue one or two more iterations and these values will be even better actually. But uh, without of uh, I mean looking at practical aspects there is no point of in doing too much actually. All right, so that is uh, what it is again similarly you can see case 2. Okay, it reduces first iteration, second and third. I mean, second, third and fourth are here. Really, first iteration, second, third and fourth are here. Like that, actually, it proceeds all everywhere. All right. Also, some sometimes some somebody can think about what is this MPQC. Okay, sometimes uh, we thought of like okay, we'll define it as model predictive quadratic control because this is this is all in terms of quadratic parameterization. Basically, so it's all various names basically. All right, so then we thought of okay, we will validate it uh, using 6 of simulation and all like uh, so the 6 degree of freedom model using a control in the loop and things like that. And also see that even if you put a autopilot loop or control synthesis loop uh, using full 6 degree of freedom nonlinear equations and all that and uh, the inner loops are designed based on uh, the dynamic inversion ideas actually. So, there also you can see that uh, I mean this uh, this guidance is able to do the job basically. Ultimately, what you what you see is something like this actually. And in this case, you have actually closed the loop. In other words, terminal phase is also there. Then what actually? So you can see this uh, this trajectory sense, These two these two trajectories gives us the picture z and y direction and x and uh, I mean this is x and uh, z direction sort of thing actually. Okay. You can see that it, the missile goes and engages with the target actually. Okay. And these are some of these results uh, with the 6 drop control in action actually. So, let me not go through the details, uh, but you can also see that how even with the, with 6 drop simulation you see that your final error is very close to 0 and final error in Z is also very close to almost on 0 and final phi and gamma are also 0. That means, uh, with the validation here I mean the level of validation is 1 degree higher I mean much more higher than this. And the guidance just guidance validation if you do that is fine, but many times it is required that you also put uh, control in the loop and then verify whether things are uh, right or not actually. Okay. And further reference if you really interested uh, to know more about this uh, this uh, particular problem I encourage you to read this uh, this paper it is uh, well documented there it is a good journal a good journal paper with uh, something like 17 pages of write up so you can see many things out there basically. Okay. All right. Now let's move quickly to what we talk about the second distinction. Okay. Again, it's a very recent development as it now as of now. So this is where we talk about uh, generalized MPSV. Okay. The whole idea here is uh, we want to develop it in continuous time domain actually. Okay. So discrete. Uh, we don't want to discretize the system dynamics to begin with really. So, again motivations are very similar, we want uh, high computational efficiency, so real time online solution that is what you are interested in, terminal conditions should be met as hard constraint, no approximation of system dynamics, minimum control usage and the, the last point is we do, we want it uh, without discretization, uh, the worst question is can the discretized problem formulation be avoided actually, okay. answer turns out to be yes and let us see how it is actually. Alright, so you have a system dynamics x dot is f of x u and y is h of x, where x is a n dimensional problem, I mean n dimensional vector, y is uh, sorry u is m dimensional vector and y is p dimensional vector standard. And we also uh, think that okay, y of t f should go to y star of t f, okay, that with some additional objectives. Okay, and that is typically the control minimization objective basically. So the objective remains exactly same. But we are not interested in discretizing the system dynamics to begin with. That's the whole idea here. So, what is our final thing? Final thing is this uh, this error. In other words, y of t f minus y star of t f should go to zero. 
philosophy is also same first we have to guess it and guess a control history we have to simulate the system dynamics to find out the error at t equal to t f and then update the control history optimally utilizing this error so the philosophy remains very very parallel actually all right so now let us see how we do that so what we what we do is okay to begin with uh, we know this system dynamics okay and this system dynamics we multiply it with some sort of a weighting matrix actually okay and time uh, this uh, time varying weighting matrix okay we multiply it to make the system dimension same as the output vector okay in other words after multiplying this both sides the dimension the i mean the system dynamics that you are looking at is something like in the p dimension actually and p is nothing but the output variable dimension actually okay. so ultimately you want to see the error in uh, in y so that's the whole idea why why you want to do actually so we multiply both sides by w of t w is something like a p by n matrix and so that the dynamics what you see is in terms of p dimension not in n dimension actually and how do you come up with this w of t that's the whole problem, whole idea here how do we you, we want to kind of propose an idea using which we can actually compute this w of t okay all right now what you do is uh, integrate both sides take this this equation and try to integrate both sides actually okay after you integrate both sides you kind of add this on both sides okay y of x of t f okay, or y of t f basically right y is a function of h of x actually so that's why y is a function of x so y of x f is what you want to multiply actually so you i mean sorry add it actually so you have this constant equation after integration and we add this this expression y of x of t f to both sides so we add this now well now what you remember you take this one this this side by the way this this expression is taken that side so it is nothing but zero so zero equal to that now y of x t f is nothing but y of x t f plus that whatever is that, that thing is there so in other words this whole expression minus this expression coming this side yes now we add both sides what you get is y of x of t f Okay, is nothing but this fellow same thing plus zero and zero is this this one minus that one entire thing here. Now if you look at this expression, it contains integral of a derivative, and when you have something like this, and if you remember your calculus of variations a little bit, whenever expressions like this are there, we typically use uh, integration by parts actually. So we'll do that here. So this expression, what you get here, we we use this integration by parts. Okay. to come up with this uh, this expression actually and if you substitute this expression back in here okay what you get here is something like this okay i suggest that you do it uh, in pen and paper yourself so that you will be much more convinced actually okay. now what happens okay now we take uh, now this expression what you have we take variations on both sides and try to combine terms actually okay so what you have to see here is uh, take variations on that i mean y of x t, y of t f variations of first variation of that and uh, apply it on the right hand side and try combine terms and all that ultimately you land up with something like this so this is something like uh, a little bit idea of calculus of variations coming into picture basically okay. then you tell okay this is uh, this we want it to be zero okay this our idea basically because delta delta xf is something that we don't know so obviously we want to make make sure that this expression is independent of that so we make it zero then we tell okay uh, initial condition is known perfectly so there is no variation of that so that has to go to zero and by design we also also want to impose that this has to be zero okay then what happens this first variation of ytf turns out to be just this one actually okay and if you suppose we define this as b of t then it turns out to be like this and again uh, in general uh, it is not really recursive computation sort of thing you can well you can think of backward integration basically that also you can call that as recursive okay. but uh, it's not a discrete formulation so strictly speaking there is nothing called recursive here actually okay. so anyway coming back to that what you are getting here is by definition v of t is like this okay so v of t is by definition like that w of t uh, sorry w dot of t is uh, this entire expression has to be zero remember that 
Okay, so W dot of t is negative of that basically really. Okay, so W dot of t is negative of that expression what you are getting here. Okay, so that will give us a differential equation to compute W of t using any numerical integration scheme, including fourth order Runge-Gutta method actually. But for integrating this, we also need a boundary condition, and then this boundary condition comes from there. Okay, remember, this is at t equal to tf. So this boundary condition comes out from this actually. Okay. That means using this boundary condition and this differential, I mean this differential equation, we can quickly propagate it backwards from tf to t naught, and then we'll get w of t everywhere. Once we get w of t everywhere, then b of t can be computed directly that way. All right, so I hope it is it's clear now. Now, okay. Now what happens here is okay. We got this expression. Okay, this is a constant equation again, and this constant equation we want to, I mean, we want to account for while minimizing this cost function actually. Okay, so that means uh, again, th remember this is your updated control. Okay, so updated control means uh, tra transpose times R times this updated control. That means we want the control minimization to happen actually. Okay, so this is the cost function that we want to optimize, minimize rather, subject to this constant equation that we are getting after imposing this actually. Once we impose this, this turns out to be like this. So this turns out to be the same constant equation actually. Now the procedure is fairly similar. You have to augmented cost function uh, similar to calculus of variations also. Okay. So augmented cost function, and you tell okay, my first uh, differentiations and all has to be zero basically. Okay. So you take about uh, del J C bar by del of uh, del U, then that turns out to be zero, and this uh, del lambda, I mean del J C bar by del lambda also it needs to be equal to zero. That gives us the same boundary condition that we are we started with, which is compatible to Standard results actually. All right, so if you do that and solve for this, okay, uh, we get something like this expression, like these three. Okay, now if you substitute for delta u here, okay, then you get uh, some expression in terms of lambda. Then you solve for lambda. Okay, once you get solve, once you solve for lambda, you put it back and then tell, okay, this is my delta u t. Once you get delta u, you are done actually because your control is, I mean, the updated control is nothing but u naught minus delta u basically that way. All right, so u naught minus delta u is the control of date, and that is delta u. You just computed here, get okay, this expression, and that's that's what it turns out to be. Okay, where lambda is like this. Okay. Lambda turns out to be like this. A lambda and b lambda are also defined that way. Very very close to what we know in in MPSP, but these are all continuous time expressions actually. Okay, remember a lambda and b lambda were summations before. Now it has become integrations actually, which is very compatible to what you know. Algorithm sense it is similar, uh, very similar again, but the only difference is uh, we we compute the weighting matrix by backward integration. It is there is no recursive computation of sensitivity matrices. We call that as weighting matrix here, and then. Uh, you compute the weighting matrix by backward integration and then update the control if necessary very quickly basically. Okay. Now using, using uh, usage of this uh, particular in uh, in the same problem let us revisit and see what all results you are getting and uh, as expected results will be fairly similar to what you got before actually. So this is uh, the same problem that we talked in the previous lecture uh, tactical missile guidance with 3D impact angle constraint. And the motivation for that, why do we do and, uh, and things like that, have been discussed last lecture. So I'll, I'm not going to talk about that again. All right. So motivation uh, again is uh, something like: is possible to, I mean, is it possible to achieve impact angle constraint in uh, 3D simultaneously in some of 3D means azimuth and elevation both actually? Can you do that in some optimal manner, basically that way? And can this terminal constant in both the angles? That means azimuth angle, which is, uh, which talks about uh, direction of heading, and elevation angle, which talks about uh, pitch angle or something like uh, top angle from the top and all that. The can it be di dictated? Can it be told to the guidance logic actually? And then can can the above objective can the above objective be achieved for stationary targets or moving targets or maneuvering targets? All are ground target, but the target can have can be either stationary or just moving or just or maneuvering, 
I mean, it many words it can have constant lateral acceleration, it can have time varying lateral acceleration, all sort of things. Actually, okay. so these things, uh, I mean, is it possible to do? That's what you are talking. Actually, also we are telling can this be achieved with minimum lateral acceleration demand? Recapitulate or revisit the challenges. Uh, first thing is the system dynamics is uh, nonlinear, and uh, something like strong nonlinear coupling between elevation angle and azimuth angle has to be accounted for. You cannot uh, think about decoupling them and just design at it one at time sort of thing. And uh, zero, or zero or near zero mist distance is desired because uh, without zero mist distance, angle constraints have no meaning actually. Unless you, uh, unless the vehicle falls on the target, what's the value of uh, angles other way? So that's why it is uh, extremely important here. Uh, 3D impact angle constraints are desired. Essentially, two angle constraints actually simultaneously, and uh, lateral demand has to be minimum as minimum as possible throughout sort of thing. Also, remember this lateral acceleration history has some implication of uh, what is called as induced drag actually. If, if the vehicle turns more, then it the, the induced drag component turns out to be more also. So, hence we by minimizing the lateral acceleration, we minimize the the induced drag component of it, and hence uh, the, there is some range extension implication and all that actually. Okay, so the engagement scenario is very similar to what we had discussed in the last class. It starts with some sort of initial condition, and finally falls with some target. And at that point of time, the there is there are two angle constant. One is this angle, the other one is that angle. Actually. Essentially, this angle turns out to be something like if you extend this trajectory a little bit, and this angle is the negative gamma f, but this angle is same as the other side of negative gamma f actually. Okay. All right. So that's how it is actually. So system dynamics very same what we discussed before. State vector. Okay, v gamma psi and uh, and x y z control variables are z a y, okay. and delays and all that is also been accounted for while evaluating the guidance loss sort of thing. Target model is a ground target, so we have only x y, so x x dot and y dot is dictated by psi, and what psi dot is dictated by lateral acceleration that the target applies to itself actually. So, in some sense, point mass model is assumed. Uh, measurement of coordinates are available. Target velocity is constant, uh, and things like that. Actually, so these are uh, somewhat, uh, I mean, realistic assumptions. But uh, it cannot this this can always be relaxed with uh, some sort of uh, estimation in the loop, which we are not talking here actually. Right. And if the target is moving, it can uh, it can do the following. That means it can simply continue to move in a straight line, no constant maneuver. I mean, no maneuver, but it just simply moves in a straight line. Otherwise, it can also have constant g maneuvers, keeps on turning in a constant manner. Otherwise, it can have sinusoidal maneuver as well, actually. And a combination of that can is also a possibility. Okay, here what you are telling is whatever the target does is kind of known to the guidance of the missile, actually. Typically, that turns out to be a hard problem also. And that's where estimation uh, logics are important, and uh, an estimation is supposed to give target estimation rather is supposed to give the required information to the guidance law actually. But anyway, coming back to that, uh, this is the problem formulation. We have this uh, final y, which is given in terms of gamma and psi, and in terms of x, y, z, they have to go to some desired values by star basically. Okay. And the uh, guess history is augmented p n, same thing as what you had uh, shown in the last class. Sigma dot you compute first, and then this will have three components: sigma dot x, sigma dot y, sigma dot z. In terms of using this sigma dot x and sigma dot y, you can compute sigma dot p and sigma dot y. Okay, so this kind of thing, and then it turns out to be okay, okay. You can compute this v c as well. Okay. Using this expression, and then tell okay my a z and n y a sorry a y. Can be computed something like this. So more on that is available in, in standard literature. Anyway. Then you apply our our newly developed continuous time uh, MPSP or uh, rather generalized MPSP actually. Then you get very similar results what you have done given before. I mean, so before in the next lecture sort of. So here you talk about initial condition being same two angles. Okay, but uh, three different cases are there where your desired desired values of gamma and psi are different different combinations actually. 
and this is the just three cases we are telling but that is it has been validated with a number of cases like this it is some i mean much more case much more number of cases arbitrarily selected values like that actually that way okay now if you see that no matter whatever angle constants you put you are able to go there with that actually okay now 3d sense it may not be so easy to see but that's why you has plotted this uh, this image plots and all that one image plot is in terms of uh, z and x this is the image plane and uh, one in terms of x and y so that's that's the image plane actually so there is also somewhat clear how the angles are developing but if you really want a particular clear value of representation and all that you can always plot in 2d and c anyway guidance commands turns out to be like this and you can see that uh, the lateral acceleration demand is not really very much say about 6g i mean within within 6g here and uh, something like within 3g here and here also if you see minus 3. Point, uh, probably 3.2g maximum value and these are very much achievable in a, in a good missile actually so the lateral acceleration demand turns out to be very much all right and also you can see there are not too much too much of fluctuations on the way it just kind of develops very smoothly okay initially there is some sort of a small rapid development but later on the later onwards it remains somewhat fairly smooth okay so this this kind of a lateral acceleration is uh, very good because uh, in inner loops can track this uh, histories uh, very well actually okay. all right so now we can see from uh, from trajectories okay for for a different initial condition but same final condition okay. final condition is required same but the initial condition can be different okay. so that's what it happens again it is able to meet meet it no matter whatever is our initial condition okay now if you really see whether it is happening or not happening you can actually plot these angle values okay how they are developing tell at the end all these are meeting at the same values minus 20 degree and all these are meeting at the same values plus 20 degree and that's what we wanted minus 20 and plus 20 so that gives us a validation of how what is happening in a clear way basically okay now if you take uh, stationary targets again for perturbation of initial conditions what happens this is this is what you are talking about and what happens in terms of uh, lateral acceleration you can see az and ay again it is within some minus 9.5 g sort of thing and here also it is 4 g maximum or maybe 5 g here if you look at it actually now remember this uh, missiles are typically uh, the lateral acceleration constraints are typically of the order of uh, 10 g 15 g like that actually okay. so this uh, this numbers what you see here what you are looking at here is very much within the capability all right now how does it compare with respect to apn okay the augmented pn remember the augmented pn is the one which serves as the gas history ir irrespective of whatever conditions we want to put that is kind of a default gas history actually then you can tell okay if, if i take uh, gamma naught and psi naught as 0 20 okay but i want this particular values minus 80 and 20 then what is the well, how can it comp i mean how does it compare you can see one is uh, does not talk about angle constraint so it goes its own way but it finally meets at the position but the other one not only meets it but it also satisfies the angle constraint actually basically so the trajectory shaping happens i mean if i saw that the final angle constraints are met actually so you can again see this uh, this angles uh, gamma and then psi m in one case they are very far off from what you desire the solid line okay is what you what you ultimately want okay. This dotted line is uh, what happens in APN. If, if there are some waving, I mean, behavior. Ultimately, the point is, it is too far away from what we require. What we require is almost vertical impact. That means minus 80 degree with 20 degree azimuth angle constraint. Okay, so this is what the 20 degree you can see, the black line, sort of thing, solid line. Okay. So that is the difference. If I, yes, not only you get it there, but you get it there in a very smooth way, sort of thing. And this is another plot which tells us that okay, if the target uh, does either straight line or a constant turning or a sinusoidal behavior, okay, then can I do that? And answer is yes. Each of the cases you are able to engage with the target. 
But also remember here we are assuming that this behavior of the target is actually known from our uh, good estimation logic which we are not discussing here. Okay, so, any misdistance uh, in this particular cases will turn out to be uh, there is a large contribution from the estimation loop really is not with respect to the guidance loop actually. Mm -hmm. That validation is uh, is being shown here in this picture. All right. So, this is also you can see number wise the final numbers are here okay, one case minus 20, other case minus 40, other case minus 60 and here it is minus 20, so minus 30 and minus 40 basically everything is met. Uh, so, it is here and interestingly there is another comparison which uh, talks about comparison with something called uh, zero effort miss plot and you can see the zero effort miss for APN is very wavy and ultimately it, it goes to zero, but uh, MPSP ZDM it turns out to be much more smoother on the throughout actually and that is a good sign of a good guidance law. So, concluding remarks of uh, GMPSP, this uh, generalized MPSP formulation discretization of the system dynamics is not required okay. and any higher order uh, technique can be used and one standard thing can be thought about is fourth order Rage Kuta scheme which is very standard in integrating numerical uh, numerically the differential equations actually. So, if you think about putting that you can simply put it. If you want uh, different integration scheme other than Ange Kuta method, uh, that also you are welcome to do that actually. And it also turns out that MPSP is a special case of uh, generalized MPSP, and those things I am not going to discuss here. Uh, then now we have actually applied this to a 3D impact angle guidance uh, constant guidance problem, it has been uh, kind of solved using this, this technique actually. Results are pretty similar to MPSP results and Sometimes uh, some superior results also have been seen, okay. Either it is similar or superior because uh, suddenly the discretization is not there from the beginning. So, the accuracy level is very good from the beginning itself actually. And then uh, sometimes, I mean, la, mom, why sometimes? Sometimes it is a little bit superior to MPSP, but many times it is superior to PN guidance law, and that is uh, both for uh, regular MPSP or, or the MPSP actually. Okay, because what you are telling here is we are uh, we are uh, making use of uh, this up this uh, benefits of nonlinear optimal control theory actually. That is why the the results are much superior okay, as compared to the augmented PN law. All right, so that's what I wanted to discuss in this particular lecture. Thank you.